Hello team, I'm Colonel Pat Miller, Commander of the 88th Air Base Wing and Installation Commander for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. During this town hall, we'd like to give you an update on where we are with respect to our current fight against COVID. Earlier today, I transitioned the installation to Health Protection Condition Bravo. And over the course of this town hall, we'll talk about why, give you some information and data on what it looks like in our local area, talk about our services and how that may adjust, what you're gonna see across the installation, do a little bit of a deep dive into telework because that's a question uh, that is on everybody's mind uh, and then kind of wrap things up and tell you where we're going. Before we get there though, I'd ask you to just kind of uh, indulge me for a second and reflect back to two years ago. Two years ago today, the city of Dayton experienced the tragedy of the Dayton nightclub shooting where nine individuals lost their lives and 17 plus were injured in just 32 seconds. So I ask you to just kind of pause, reflect, think back to that night, where you were at, the emotions that were going on. Think about those nine lives lost, those injured. Also think about those brave officers and bystanders that ran to the fight, that stepped up to the challenge, that ended this tragedy in 32 seconds instead of a minute, two minutes, 10 minutes. Thank those brave individuals that stepped up. And then thank all those brave individuals that stepped up afterwards to help answer the question why and what's next. How do we help? How do we grow? How do we learn? How do we get better? How do we stay Dayton strong? That was a tough experience. And so I just ask that you pause with me for a few seconds and reflect back on that night, those heroes and those we've lost. All right, thanks. I appreciate uh, you spending that brief bit of time uh, for me. Uh, we can't forget those moments. Um, we can't forget the strength that we build out of those moments uh, as we come together and face challenges, just like we're facing today uh, with the current surge in the COVID uh, virus and specifically this Delta variant. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier today, uh, I transitioned the installation to HPCon Bravo, Health Protection Condition Bravo. Uh, and what I did not do is declare a new public health emergency. Those are two separate things that we're gonna break apart and explain why uh, we went to HBCon Bravo but did not declare a public health emergency again. In doing so, you're gonna see some familiar faces. You're gonna see uh, myself and then uh, Colonel Christian Lyons, our medical group commander, uh, who's gonna talk about what we're seeing in this surge and what our medical services are doing to help protect the team. Then you're gonna see a new face. You're gonna see Cur Colonel Serena Morris. Uh, Colonel Morris is our new mission support group commander. She replaced Colonel Paul Berger, and she's gonna talk about uh, some of the impacts or what you'll see around the installation with some of those support services that you use each and every day. Following Colonel Morris, Mr. Greg Leingang, the vice director for the 88th Air Base Wing, is gonna talk a little bit about telework and what that looks like and some of the flexibilities we have in today's environment especially when we don't have that public health emergency, which allows supervisors to direct individuals to telework. And so we'll spend a brief bit of time talking about telework in the current environment. And then I'll come back on and wrap things up. But before we get to Colonel Lyons, I wanna talk about the decision to transition the installation to Health Protection Condition Bravo. If you recall last week, we added in the masks, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. That was kind of that first step to ramp up uh, protection measures for individuals across the installation. And lots of folks, especially the vaccinated folks asked, hey, why? Why do I, as a vaccinated individual, have to wear a mask uh, in this current environment? And that's mainly to do with the Delta variant. Data has proven and shown that the Delta variant is actually transmissible by members that are vaccinated. That was not uh, the case. Uh, science did not show that with other variants, but the Delta variant has been more aggressive, more highly trans, uh, transmissible. Uh, we are also starting to see breakthrough cases where vaccinated individuals uh, are testing positive for COVID. And so for those two reasons, the, the uh, uh, small number of breakthrough cases, and when I, when I say small number, uh, what we're seeing is uh, roughly an 83% uh, uh, effectiveness of the uh, COVID vaccine against the Delta variant. Um, and so we're seeing some small cases, uh, breakthrough cases. The plus side is those vaccinated folks that have that breakthrough case, we're not seeing hospitalizations and we're seeing mild symptoms. So we're seeing the vaccination is working, uh, even with that Delta variant, but we are getting some breakthrough cases. 
And because of those breakthrough cases and the science showing that uh, the Delta variant is transmissible by vaccinated individuals, uh, the Department of Defense, the CDC recommended, and the Department of Defense pushed out guidance to require masks for all individuals when you're indoors. So that's the why behind the masks. But as we continued to watch the COVID cases increase across the nation, across the state, and locally, uh, those were the triggers that drove us to implementing Health Protection Condition Bravo today. Uh, some of those triggers, some of those uh, uh, data sources that we used out there. One, the Center for Disease Control has a COVID data tracker. Uh, it's a great resource. If you just Google uh, CDC COVID data tracker, uh, you'll be able to get this. And you will see an overall map of the United States. Uh, and that map is going to show you areas that are red, uh, and that red indicates high community transmission, uh, areas that are orange, uh, which indicate substantial community transmission, yellow for moderate, and blue for low. And so when you look at that map, what has been amazing to me over the course of the last week or so uh, since I found that resource was the progression of red coming up the United States, uh, working closer and closer to where we, we are. And so on last week, late last week, whenever I uh, rolled out the mask mandate for uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, that's because our surrounding communities were showing substantial, kind of that second highest level of uh, community transmission. When I came back to work on Monday and pulled out that resource again, three of our four surrounding counties were red, high community transmission. And so that got the team uh, going full bore saying, hey, it's time. It's time for us to make the switch, to protect the team, to protect the mission, to protect you. And so we made the decision earlier today to roll the base into Health Protection Condition Bravo. Um, I will tell you what we're seeing uh, both in our own tracking on installation as we're doing our testing and as we're seeing uh, reporting uh, folks coming in and reporting COVID positives and we work through contact, contact tracing, uh, we are seeing the same signs that our community is seeing, the state seeing, uh, and the nation seeing. We are seeing an increase in cases uh, over the course of the last several weeks. Uh, there was a point in time where we were down to one to two cases a week. Now we're getting back into that threshold of three to six cases a day. And it just is exponentially growing each and every day. And so we want to get ahead of that. And so that's the, what the transition for Health, Health Protection Condition Bravo does for us. It helps us put extra precautions in place to protect the team and protect the mission. So why not a public health emergency? When I look at whether to declare a public health emergency or not, I wanted to look at our capability and capacity to deal with this COVID pandemic. We have learned a ton over the course of the last 18 months. And when you look back and you realize we went to Bravo and Charlie early on in the process uh, and we issued that public health uh, emergency declaration, uh, we didn't have the testing capability that we have today. We didn't have the treatment capability that we had today, that we have today. We didn't have a vaccination uh, back then or a vaccine back then to be able to, to uh, strengthen our armor in this fight. Uh, and our hospital capacity was diminishing by the day. Whenever I look at us today, there is a lot of testing capability and capacity, not just in the installation, but in the surrounding communities. We have the ability to treat. We've learned a lot more about this virus. We have the ability to prevent as we work through our proven mitigating measures of wearing a mask, of practicing good hygiene, of maintaining six foot of physical distancing uh, around folks, of staying home if you're not feeling well, and then getting tested if you're showing those symptoms. So those mitigating measures, we've learned a lot from. Uh, we've got the vaccine that's out available here within our, uh, from our medical center and vac other vaccine options that are available in the local community. The vaccination age has dropped uh, from uh, you know, that 16 year old to now that uh, 12 year old and up. Uh, so we continue to evolve and be able to arm up more of our population. And our hospital capacity, both on base as well as in the surrounding com uh, community is great. What I will caution you though, is hospitalizations are a lagging indicator. Meaning that typically whenever you see a hospitalization, it's several weeks after uh, folks uh, have, been, have contracted uh, COVID. And so we are seeing this surge now. We wanna get ahead of this so that hospitalizations and hospital capacities do not become an issue. Again, why are we doing health protection condition Bravo, but not the public health emergency? 
And so hopefully that uh, uh, gives you a little bit of perspective or insight into my thinking as the installation commander, as it's my responsibility to make sure that we operate, sustain, protect, and defend this installation. And the things that we're doing to keep you in the forefront uh, as, we, as we roll through this. And so as we, as we move on with this uh, Health Protection Condition Bravo, uh, what you're probably asking yourself is how does this impact me? What changes under Health Protection Condition Bravo? Well, there's a couple things. One, we're gonna continue to keep wearing the mask. That mandate came out last week. And so whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, mask wear is still required indoors. And there's some exceptions that are out there and those were advertised last week. If you need to go back and, and see that note, or I'm sure they're gonna be published here uh, as part of the uh, chat box, or you can go to our Wright-Patterson Air Force Base public site, click on the top right uh, to the coronavirus uh, in a, or the coronavirus box, and it will take you to our COVID page that has all of our latest and greatest information. And so we're gonna keep wearing masks. On gathering guidance and occupancy and those types of things, HPCon Bravo does drive us down to no more than 50% of folks in the workspace. Now that is going to be up to mission owners. So the target is no more than 50%. But there are some mission sets that we cannot do in a telework capacity. Think about our defenders at the gates. Think about our emergency room technicians. Think about those uh, controllers in the tower running the airfield. Think about folks that work in classified spaces, our emergency responders, such as our firefighters. Uh, think about uh, folks that do lab work and research and development and is very hands-on. There are jobs that are not conducive to telework. And so we are not gonna get to 50% in the workplace in those. In those areas though, we need to make sure we're emphasizing the six foot physical distancing, the mask wear, the good hygiene, the staying home when you're sick, all of those proven mitigating measures. But as a basic bar, it's 50% occupancy in the workplace. The next piece you're gonna see is in gatherings. Think retirement ceremonies, farewells, commander calls, those types of big events where you're pulling people together for a gathering, as well as some of your larger meetings in conference rooms and those types of spaces. Large gatherings cannot exceed 50 people. So we've dropped the cap to large gatherings back down to 50 people. And so you think about this 50-50 rule, right? 50% 50 occupancy, nothing larger than 50. And so the way I would break that down to you, if you've got a room that is designed for 20 people, the 50% occupancy is gonna be your rule that you follow. That means that no more than 10 people should be in that room. And it's also based off of physical distancing. You need to make sure that you have six foot of physical distancing between those 10 people. Now, let's say you've got a room that holds 200 people. Well, that's where your 50, your cap of 50 people in that room come into play, all right? And so that's the difference between 50% occupancy or no more than 50 for large gatherings. So those are some changes that are out there. The last piece, uh, or the piece that I will tell you does not change is outdoor activities. Uh, we are not changing uh, gathering guidance for outdoor activities. Uh, so there's no restrictions on that. All we ask you to do is maintain that physical distancing. And so I guess I need to correct myself. I say there's no restrictions. You still need to maintain that six foot of physical distancing in those outdoor activities. Um, and I would ask you and encourage you not to kind of congregate or aggregate together in groups or clumps. You need to maintain that physical distancing. And if it's an area where there are larger crowds, uh, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, you probably want to wear a mask. And so that's how we're approaching outdoor activities. So there's a difference between outdoor and indoor activities. Uh, the other thing that we're not changing and we're leaving up to mission owners is leave and travel. So there's no uh, restrictions on leave and travel at this time. Again, we're not declaring a public health emergency. We believe we have the right tools in place, but we are transitioning the health protection condition Bravo to increase our protection and our mitigating measures. And so when you, what I would ask is as you think through your travel, whether that's leave or TDY uh, for official work travel, be smart about it. Uh, if you look at the, if you follow the news and see some of the areas, we know that places like Florida and Texas and Missouri are hot spots right now. And so you may want to reconsider travel to Florida, Texas, or Missouri, or any of those other areas on that CDC tracker that you're seeing that are extremely hot spots, or extreme hot spots. Uh, and so think through that. Uh, and then if you decide to go, make sure you're having that conversation with your supervisor on your return trip to see if maybe telework 
uh, is the right thing for you, uh, at least for a couple days, to make sure that no uh, symptoms pop up uh, as you return and jump back into the mission set wherever you work. And so I've walked through a couple of those things, kind of highlighted where we're at with HPCon Bravo and why we made that transition, uh, why we did not implement a uh, public health emergency, and how that impacts you. So I'm going to step away and turn the floor over to Colonel Lyons, who's going to walk you through a little bit more of the, the details, the why, what we're seeing, give you some more uh, solid numbers, and then talk about our medical services and how the team is ready uh, to equip you better in this fight that we're in. Thank you very much, Colonel Miller. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to highlight some key data points uh, to you and reinforce a little bit of the why that Colonel Miller uh, talked about. So um, you may hear a couple of uh, redundancies in my talk, but I want to, again, highlight a few key items for you. So the CDC updated masking guidance last week that recommended everyone, whether they're vaccinated or not, wear a mask indoors in places where the coronavirus is spreading widely. The medical experts support that masking up is essential to combat this highly contagious Delta variant that is now so prevalent in our communities and across our nation. Therefore, the DOD has updated mask guidelines for all DOD personnel, service members, federal employees, on-site contractors, and visitors, regardless of the vaccination status, to wear a mask while indoors on the installation and other facilities controlled by the DOD when the local area's community transmission risk is classified as substantial or high. So, in our surrounding communities, the transmission risk has been graded as high, the highest transmi transmissibility rating for Green, Miami, and Montgomery counties, and substantial for Clark and Warren counties. Therefore, we're, we're going to continue to urge you to take the protective measures and the measured steps to wear a mask indoors, maintain six feet of physical distancing between people, practice good hand hygiene, optimize telework, and stay home if you're not feeling well, and to get tested. Our COVID screening line is open, and you can schedule a COVID test by calling 257-SHOT, that's S-H-O-T, and select option two. Additionally, if you're not vaccinated, please remain educated and up to date on various vaccine options. Vaccines have proven to work. Over 99% of deaths and 97% of hospitalizations are among the unvaccinated population. To schedule your COVID vaccine, please also call our 257 shot line and select option one. The Delta variant is now trending upwards of 90% of the cause of new cases in many areas. Those who are most susceptible are those who are unvaccinated. According to our local infectious disease partners, they are seeing that greater than 95% of their hospitalized COVID-19 patients are unvaccinated. So that's what's happening here as well in our local area. Yet there's increasing evidence that the Delta variant may spread more easily from vaccinated people than earlier variants, which this highlights again, the need to wear a mask as well as to follow those other physical protective measures that I listed for you. Reviewing our last 122 COVID positive cases, and that's from the 1st of June, June until present, 25 of those individuals were fully vaccinated. So here locally at the installation, based on the folks that we've tested, roughly about 20% of our latest COVID positives have been vaccinated. But of those, none have been hospitalized or have exhibited severe illness at this point. Now, we have seen some of our base personnel who are fully vaccinated and yet who are perhaps dismissing or downplaying COVID-like symptoms such as fever and chills cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headache, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea or vomiting, or diarrhea. Considering that breakthrough infections for fully vaccinated folks are possible, we encourage people to get tested if you are exhibiting symptoms, especially if you have had close contact to a positive or suspected COVID-19 case. It's better to be safe and prevent the spread of the infection, even if you are vaccinated. Now, I do wanna highlight um, some items for you about when to isolate and when to quarantine. For vaccinated personnel, fully vaccinated individuals who have been exposed to COVID-19, but are not experiencing symptoms, you do not need to quarantine. If you start though to experience symptoms, then you should get a COVID-19 test 
and isolate until those results are received. For unvaccinated personnel, unvaccinated individuals who've been exposed to COVID-19 but are not experiencing symptoms should still quarantine. If you start to experience symptoms, then you should get a COVID-19 test and isolate again and quarantine yourself until those results are received. Again, we know that those who are fully vaccinated have a strong protective effect against all forms of the COVID virus, including the Delta variant, especially against developing more severe forms of a COVID-19 infection. So I wanna reiterate yet again, if you feel sick, please stay at home and schedule an appointment to be tested at our COVID screening team line, which is adjacent to our medical center by calling 257-SHOT and select option two or schedule an appointment with your primary care provider if you feel like you need to see a member of our healthcare team. We are open for business and we are here to serve you. Fortunately, if you're vaccinated and have symptoms, yes, you have to isolate and get a test, but if you have a negative COVID test with decreased symptoms, then you can return back to work. Also, I'd like to encourage you to please sign up for the TRICARE online portal, which will enable you access almost instantaneously to those test results once they are completed by our lab, so you can see what your result is as soon as it's ready. You can access it easy, even easy from your smartphone. So please sign up for the TRICARE online portal. It's your tool to help you to have best access to that information and give you peace of mind. Now, I'd like to talk to, talk to you for a moment about the potential for a COVID-19 booster shot. Uh, for those who have been vaccinated, as it has driven many questions uh, to our base and to our medical center. Companies like Pfizer have reportedly started working on a booster for the COVID-19 vaccine. However, the FDA, the CDC, and the National Institutes of Health maintain that there's not enough evidence yet that we need to go ahead with boosters. Our national health experts all support that the current vaccines available offer excellent protection against COVID-19 infections and the severity of those infections. Now, time, evolution of the virus, and greater evidence might support the need for a booster in the future, but currently, you can feel protected, and I encourage you not to be complacent, but you can feel protected about your protection uh, uh, and feel protected uh, against the virus and its current variants if you've completed the vaccination series of one of the approved COVID-19 vaccines. That allows me to reiterate as well, the best protection that you have against the COVID-19 uh, infection, including the Delta variant, is to become vaccinated. Our medical center stands ready to provide you with the Pfizer vaccine series, which is currently the, the form of the vaccine that we're providing, and you can schedule your vaccine appointment again by calling 257-SHOT and select option one. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. With that, I will turn over to Colonel Morris, the MSG commander. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Serena Morris, and I recently took command of the mission support group here. And I'm super excited to be a part of Team Wright Pat and the great, greater Dayton area. There are lots of questions on how HPCOM Bravo will affect support services provided by the MSG. At this time, we are not closing or further limiting any of our services. ID cards will still be issued, gates will remain open, speeders will still get ticketed, TMO will process your household good pickups and deliveries, food will still be served, and holes in one will still be made. Well, maybe not the holes in one, they're probably not happening now. What you will see is an increased precaution measures and enforcement of those measures in our facilities. Masks are mandatory in all our customer service areas, and we ask our patrons physically distance themselves from one another while waiting to be served. We will have sanitation stations available for use, and please continue to practice good hand hygiene, safety for you, your family, and our colleagues. Our child care facilities continue to be mandated, mandate mask areas for all those to and over. You may have seen over the past few weeks, we've had several positive cases in our CDCs. When we experience positive cases, we work closely with public health for guidance and contract tracing. Additionally, we immediately notify parents of children in affected rooms, publish this information on social media for further outreach within the community, deep clean the room and the entire facility out of an abundance of caution, and isolate any affected staff members. 
Rest assured, the health and safety of your children and our staff, and our staff members are a top priority for us. As mentioned, the gates will continue to operate under normal conditions and will adjust based on the needs of, and throughput over the next several weeks. And what I, we do continue to ask for our supporting mission partners is that we will continue to use our entry authorization liaisons or EGLES to continue to expedite the personnel through the gates. While, and while the transmission rate of infection is low for this interaction, out of an abundance of caution and the peace of mind of many, we will be returning to the contactless scanning of our ID cards, meaning personnel will present their ID cards to the, to the gate entry controller like this. They can scan the back. Once you hear it beep, turn it around to the front so they can get a good look at your face and your, the picture on your ID. And once verified, they will allow you to proceed. We will also continue to execu execute the Air Force physical fitness assessments. We recommend to the mass extent possible these assessments be accomplished outdoors where transmission risk is reduced. Since we started testing about a, mo about a month ago, just over a thousand tests have been executed uh, without incident. So we believe that this, is, this process is going well. Talking about physical fitness, we are monitoring the situation closely with regards to the, this year's Air Force Marathon. We are discussing with public health and the local government, along with other race directors in our local area, on how they are looking to proceed. Today, we are still planning to execute the race both in person and virtually. However, please continue, the Air Force Marathon, continue to monitor the Air Force Marathon webpage and Facebook page for more up-to-date information. Last but surely not least, we are still committed, committed to staying socially connected while physically distant. As, um, as Colonel Miller mentioned, outdoor interactions and activities are still a go. And so the party at the pond, as I like to call it, or officially the block party, is still on for Thursday, the 12th of August from five to seven. So we ask that everyone come out and just really continue to stay connected with our friends and our neighbors. Thank you again for your time and attention. I'm excited to be a part of the team and I look forward to working and serving many of you over the next several years. Thank you. Next, following me will be Mr. Line Gang, the Air Base Wing Vice Director. Thank you, Colonel Morris. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit uh, today about telework and what HPCon Bravo means for telework policy. Um, so as we were planning for this afternoon and the, the reinstatement of HPCon Bravo, um, we kind of uncovered some confusion uh, over, over telework, and, and I want to uh, clarify that a little bit. So um, HPCon Bravo today, relative to telework, uh, looks a little bit different than uh, HPCon Bravo uh, previously. Um, and that's because, as Colonel Miller stated, when we were previously under HPCOM Bravo, we were also under a local public health emergency um, and a continuity of operations plan. And it was the public health emergency and the COOP that actually gave supervisors the authority to direct people to telework. And as Colonel Miller stated, now, as we enter back into HBCon Bravo, the wing commander has not, at least yet, declared a local public health emergency and implementation of the COOP. And so that means that today, under HBCon Bravo, supervisors do not have the authority to direct employees to telework. And so, as you heard uh, previously with HPCOM Bravo, you've got that 50% uh, capacity or 50 person uh, limit. And supervisors might be asking your, you know, themselves, well, how, how am I gonna reach uh, that, that overarching goal if I can't direct my employees to telework? Um, and, and that's some of the questions that we've been asked. And so uh, I would encourage all of you to understand the unique telework guidance that your organization has and to use the existing flexibilities that you have to reach those broad overarching HPCon Bravo 
manning goals for your, for your office. Um, in general, you're going to have the flexibility you need with regular telework and situational or ad hoc telework um, to, to reach those staffing, uh, staffing goals for your office to maintain that, that physical distance. Um, and uh, as we've been leading up to today also, our public uh, affairs office has received multiple questions from folks asking, uh, why doesn't the wing implement a base-wide standard telework policy? And I think that's a, a really great question that I, I want to address this afternoon as well. So um, Wright-Patterson uh, obviously is a very large installation, and um, there are actually almost a hundred individual organizations that call Wright-Patterson home. Each of those organizations have their own unique telework uh, policies and, and procedures. Uh, not all of those organizations are DOD organizations. We have multiple uh, federal agencies represented here on the installation, um, and certainly multiple services, multiple MAGCOMs, um, each, again, with their own unique um, telework policies. Uh, and so that makes, um, makes it... Uh, really, really uh, not practical for, um, for the wing to direct a, a standard uh, overarching uh, telework policy for the, for the installation. Um, the best approach is to establish those overarching uh, staffing goals, and that's what the HPCon level does. And then we have to allow individual commanders and directors who understand their missions uh, to do what they need to do relative to telework to achieve those uh, staffing goals where possible. And as Colonel Miller mentioned, uh, it is not always possible, depending on the mission, for, um, for employees to all telework. Uh, we have a lot of folks here on the installation uh, whose work requires them to be physically present, um, and commanders and directors need to have the flexibility uh, to, to manage those missions and, and to be successful with those missions. Uh, now that said, I, I do want to point out that uh, during the height of COVID, when we were largely uh, experiencing maximum telework in many of our organizations, uh, many organizations were successful. They were able to transition to a telework or virtual environment um, and uh, many organizations actually found that um, in some ways uh, employee productivity improved um, and mission resiliency was actually positively impacted. Um, and so uh, disruption always um, allows us new opportunities. And, um, and so I would want to encourage everyone uh, to, to look at this time of disruption and recognize the opportunity that it provides us um, to think about work differently. And where telework is possible, how might telework uh, be optimized uh, here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base? That's a challenge we all have, um, and that's a very important thing that we need to address um, to get after uh, critical topics like uh, employee retention, employee satisfaction, and as I said before, mission effectiveness and mission resiliency. Um, and, and as you look at telework, understand that it is so important for you to work with your human resource representatives um, and ensure that you have the appropriate telework agreements documented and in place. Even when we were under the previous public health emergency and COOP, it was a requirement that every teleworking employee have a telework agreement in place. And that requirement still exists today. So I want to encourage supervisors, uh, please ensure that you're working with your employees uh, to get those telework agreements in place. Uh, many organizations require that the employee and the supervisor both take um, a training class uh, prior to entering into a telework agreement. 
um, and that the telework agreement be documented in writing. So understand those requirements for your organization. Now's the time uh, to make sure you've got all of, all of that document, documentation in place to avoid misunderstandings. Um, and, and finally, you know, again, just please consult uh, with your supervisors if you have any individual questions. Supervisors, consult with your HR professionals um, if you're not sure about your telework requirements in your individual uh, organization. And, and, and I want to thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to Colonel Miller. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Langang and teammates. Uh, can't emphasize enough the power of telework, uh, not just to provide the uh, extra protection, health and safety for our teams, uh, but also to ensure uh, effective uh, mis mission execution. We've seen over the course of the last 18 months how powerful telework can be, uh, and we know that uh, uh, we can still get the mission done uh, while protecting our teammates. And so uh, continue to navigate uh, telework, understand what it is, and like Mr. Langang said, uh, that's really a, a conversation between a teammate and their supervisor, and a focus on what jobs are compatible for telework, uh, and what situations make sense for the individuals to be able to do the, do that uh, telework? Uh, do they have the right uh, capability to get out there and do that uh, from another location? So I appreciate you spending a few minutes uh, walking through the nuances between this HBCon Bravo and the last time we were in HBCon Bravo and charting a path for our team uh, to try and optimize telework uh, to get to that uh, 50 percent uh, in, in the uh, work centers. One area I want to touch on before we uh, uh, move to questions, uh, because there has been a lot of questions on this specific one, is the president's uh, executive order uh, that he uh, rolled out with last week. And just for a refresher for those uh, that aren't familiar with it, uh, last week President Biden uh, asked uh, the Department of Defense to consider making the COVID vaccination mandatory uh, as part of our requirements for military members. And so, in other words, uh, we've got a litany of uh, vaccinations that we as military members have to get uh, and adding the COVID vaccine to that. So making it mandatory for military members. Uh, the president also uh, directed that all federal employees uh, across the board, all federal employees, uniformed and non-uniform wearing, as well as across the other uh, agencies in the federal government, uh, that uh, they sign a, a form attesting uh, to whether they have received the COVID vaccine or not. And if you recall, uh, we were not able to ask uh, if somebody has been vaccinated or not. Some policy guidance came out last week that allows commanders to ask military members now if they've been vaccinated. Uh, and then in the case of our non-uniform teammates, our civilians, uh, if there is uh, cause to believe that uh, somebody is not vaccinated um, but is, is uh, not going on, uh, not, not wearing a mask uh, in some venues where they're supposed to, to be able to ask that question for, the, for those non-uniform teammates. So there was a little bit of progression in policy last week on that. And then the president uh, said, hey, we're going to uh, do 100 percent attestation or confirmation uh, where you sign a form saying, hey, I'm vaccinated or not. And then for those uh, federal teammates uh, that have not been vaccinated uh, to submit to uh, testing, routine testing once or twice a week. And so that was the, the president's announcement last week. What I will tell you is how does that change anything today? Nothing yet. Okay, and so what, what happens is the president uh, rolls out the executive order uh, and then the Department of Defense uh, and specifically uh, one of the offices in the Department of Defense is looking through how do we uh, execute uh, the president's guidance. And so it's sitting up amongst the personnel and readiness folks at uh, the Office of Secretary of Defense level trying to figure out how to turn this into execution rules. Uh, once those are established, they will roll to the different services. The Department of Air Force will uh, evaluate and analyze the uh, Secretary of Defense's guidance on how to implement the President's order, uh, add some additional execution guidance, and then it will roll out to installations. So as of right now, uh, we have not moved on uh, mandating vaccines uh, for military members, uh, collecting attestation forms or confirmation forms on whether you've been vaccinated or not, or uh, rolling out that recurring testing for unvaccinated folks. So we're just standing fast. We're awaiting higher headquarters guidance. And then once we get that guidance, we will share with you how we plan on implementing that here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And so I just wanted to address that up front. Uh, so we, 
we've covered the fact that we moved to health protection condition Bravo. We've covered the fact uh, that we are not under a public health emergency. Talked about why for both of those. Colonel Lyons walked through some statistics uh, in showing uh, in more depth uh, why we made this decision. Uh, Colonel Morris walked through the services and how that's changing, uh, what you can see out there. Uh, but with any uh, battle or any war that we're in, what's our exit strategy? And so what's our exit strategy to get us out of Health Protection Condition Bravo? What can you do on the front lines in the fight that we are in today? Uh, and believe me, this is a prolonged war against COVID, a lot longer than we want it to be. Uh, we thought we were uh, doing well and uh, uh, lowered kind of some of our shields uh, as we transitioned to Health Protection Condition Bravo. But a new battle is in play with this Delta variant, uh, and so we need to start arming up again. And that's what we're doing with uh, HPCon Bravo. And so our exit strategy to get back out of Health Protection Condition Bravo, one, follow those fundamental mitigating measures. Wear that mask, good hygiene, physical distancing, optimize telework, stay home if you're feeling ill, get tested if you're showing symptoms. Right, basic blocking and tackling uh, in this fight against COVID. The next thing, arm up, literally arm up. If you are not vaccinated, get vaccinated, or at least strongly consider it, stay educated. Uh, data has shown that the vaccine is the greatest weapon we have in this war. And so whether you're getting uh, Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, uh, arm up, Take a look at that. Uh, I know Beth and I, we made the tough decision uh, to have our 13-year-old son, Adam, uh, start the vaccination process. We rumbled with it, just like many of you are rumbling with it uh, yourselves. Um, but we decided this is the right thing for our son uh, as he's getting ready to start uh, eighth grade here uh, in a few weeks. And I know he won't be fully vaccinated by that first day of school. But that first shot uh, strengthens his armor up a little bit, and then he'll get that second shot, and a couple weeks later, he will be fully armed and ready to go. And so we're excited uh, to see the flexibility and freedom that this gives him uh, as he uh, maneuvers through his next school year. Um, the other thing I would ask you is be smart off base. The rules off base are different than on base. Right? And so in this exit strategy, as you navigate the local community or you travel and do all those types of things, fall back on those basic uh, mitigating measures. Uh, stay physically distanced, wear your mask uh, in, in areas where there's crowds and those types of things. Uh, and even though there's not mandates out there, just be smart. Uh, protect yourself, protect your families, protect your teammates, protect these missions here across this installation. Uh, and then the last thing I would tell you is uh, this month, uh, as part of Air Force Materiel Command's Connect program, uh, they roll out a different topic uh, every month. And this month is all about wellness. The last way we get through this thing is focusing on our wellness. Uh, and wellness for airmen, for our Air Force teammates, for all of you, uh, can really be broken down into four domains. Uh, your physical, your mental, your social, and your spiritual. And so make sure you're investing in those four domains, focusing on your, in on your wellness, taking care of each other, uh, thinking about the things that you can control and not focusing on the things that you can't control. When you focus on those things you can't control, it drives frustration, stress, irritation, all of those other things. If you want to hear more about that, uh, Chief Schaefer, the 88th Air Base Wing Command Chief, and I sat down and had a conversation. It's part of a series called Let's Get It Right. Uh, it was posted to our 88th Air Base Wing Facebook site uh, on the 1st of August. Uh, check that out and hear our views on wellness. Uh, but more importantly, talk to each other and figure out uh, what's missing in your life, how can you support each other, how can you be there for each other. The wingman concept should be more than just a concept, it should be a way of life. We need to look out for each other, especially in these stressful, turbulent times that we're in right now. Uh, we are all in this together. Um, with that, I'm just going to pause here and see if we have any questions. Sir, uh, we do have a couple of questions, sir. Okay. Um, sir, can you please explain why personnel who have been tested positive for COVID-19 are not given the opportunity to test for antibodies before being pressured into getting the vaccination? All right. I'm going to turn that over to our 88th Medical Group Commander, Colonel Lyons. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, thanks very much for the, for the great question. Uh, we have indeed received questions regarding COVID-infected personnel who have recovered, uh, if we can consider them as being protected, and or if we have an antibody test uh, that can confirm that I have antibodies and therefore maybe I don't need to be vaccinated. So I, I want to share with you directly from our infectious disease staff. 
None of the commercially available antibody ass assays are FDA approved at this time to assess protective immunity against uh, SARS-CoV-2. That's the, the COVID-19 virus. The Infectious Disease Society of America and the CDC do not recommend baseline serology or antibody testing for the purpose of vaccine decision making. And there is emerging data that the immune response after natural infection may not be as robust against variants of concern such as Delta as compared with vaccine induced responses. So in summary, a positive antibody test does not equate to protection. Data supports that individuals with a prior infection will have better protection against COVID-19 after being vaccinated. Thank you. Thanks, Colonel Lyons. Hey, sir, we have a couple questions on occupancy for events. Okay. Can you tell us if we can still submit occupancy waivers for conference rooms, workspaces to lessen the six foot physical distancing requirement? Will waivers be considered or are they required where the request is for no physical distancing for work areas? And the same question for if there's three foot of distancing. Okay. I, I appreciate that question because, you know, one of those key changes as we navigate to HPCon Bravo affects occupancy. Uh, and I know there are events on the calendar. Uh, I know there's retirement ceremonies out there. I know there's uh, changes of command out there. Uh, there's picnics. There's all kinds of gatherings uh, that are coming uh, down the road here. And so this sudden change uh, to HPCon Bravo impacts you. Uh, and I know there's some anxiety uh, that is associated with that. And so the exception to policy process is still in place. Uh, I will tell you, we will, as we see these increase in transmission, though, uh, we're going to provide extra scrutiny on those. And so in HBCon Alpha, uh, where the community transmission rate was lower, uh, we could look at that and, and uh, be a little bit more forgiving. And so a, a transition from six foot to three foot, uh, I don't think that's going to get approved. Everyone is unique, and we will take a look at it on the surface for the event and the, and the mitigating measures that you put into play. Uh, but uh, when we look at this high rate of community transmission and a basic principle of six foot of physical distancing, uh, whenever you violate that, unless there is a lot of other mitigating measures in place, uh, we may not be able to get to that point. Uh, and so what I would tell you is take a look at the uh, gathering guidance uh, that went out. Uh, it will be posted to our coronavirus site on that uh, Wright, Pat Wright Patterson Air Force Base public site. Uh, when you go to that COVID link, uh, we'll post that uh, new gathering guidance out there. Uh, but again, it's 50% of a room occupancy, no greater than 50 people in that room, focused on that physical distancing. And so maybe uh, you, you look at your 50%, uh, but if you can't get that uh, physical distancing, then you need to reduce even more from that 50%. Uh, so follow those basic principles. Know that you can still submit uh, exceptions to policy out there. We will take a hard look at those, uh, but it's going to be a harder look right now because the transmission rate uh, is pretty rapid uh, with this Delta variant. So, sir, just a kind of a follow-up on that question. If um, folks have already submitted their exception to policy, are those on hold or are they going to still be, continue to be processed? So what I would ask you is if you've submitted an exception to policy whenever we were in health protection condition alpha and your event has not occurred yet, uh, link up with our public health team to take a look, uh, to relook at that event. The situation has changed. Um, we have seen, as you heard from Colonel Lyons, the numbers have drastically increased over the past week uh, to two weeks. Uh, it, it has been ridiculous. As a matter of fact, uh, the CDC had said in an article earlier today that the last week, last two weeks in July, uh, the Delta variant accounted for 93% of all COVID, all new COVID cases out there. So it's coming hard. It's coming fast on the uh, CDC COVID tracker. You can see the red uh, continuing to creep forward. We saw the shift just over the weekend. And so the situation has changed from whenever that ETP first came up and got approved. If you have an ETP working through the system now, we are going to look at it with HBCon Bravo in mind. Uh, and so you may want to uh, pull that back and relook at that to make sure you got the appropriate mitigating measures in there. Uh, otherwise, it may be at risk of disapproval. Sir, we have uh, one final question. Um, if there is no restriction on outdoor gatherings as long as social distancing can be maintained, can we have less than six feet of distancing at an outdoor event if face coverings are worn? 
Yeah, and so I appreciate that because that's a consideration of mitigating measures. Um, you're, you're saying, hey, I've got a, an outdoor event, and we've seen transmission rates in outdoor events uh, are extremely low. So it's a low-risk area, which is why we have not changed our gathering guidance for outdoor events. But we have that basic principle of six foot of physical distancing. Uh, and so I think that is a strong consideration. Uh, if everybody is required to wear a mask, and I, and I would say it's probably a non-eating event because whenever you move down the mask, if you are sitting closer than uh, six feet, mask comes down and you're eating, that's a chance to transmit uh, that virus. So I, I would have to look at the parameters around it, but I would say if it was a non-eating event, everybody's wearing mask outdoors, we would consider that exception to policy. But we'd have to have the full details to make that decision. Final question, sir. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, Team, thanks. Uh, I know this one has been longer than our previous ones uh, because we have a, we've had a lot of information that we wanted to share with you today. Uh, this transition back to Bravo is not something we wanted to do, uh, but in order to protect the team, to protect the missions, this is something we need to do. And so, uh, like I said, earlier today, we made that official transition to health protection condition Bravo. We did not declare a public health emergency. We believe we had the right mitigating measures out there and the right capability and capacity to deal uh, with this new surge of cases. But we need your help. We need you to do what you need to do uh, to strongly consider uh, and go ahead and get vaccinated, to do all the uh, basic blocking and tackling for our mitigating measures, to look out for each other, take care of each other, and let us know uh, where you need your support or where you need our support. Uh, the one thing I would, I, I would say as we sign off, you know, I talk about COVID like we're in a war, right? We're in this big fight against uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, and we've, ha we've seen these little mini battles that we've been uh, fighting along the way, and the Delta variant is one. Um, but I don't, I don't say that flippantly, and I know uh, war is a serious thing, which, which kind of brings me to uh, this weekend. Uh, this weekend, Saturday, the 7th of August, uh, is actually Purple Heart Day. Uh, and so I just want to put that on your radar uh, and think through uh, those folks have, who have made sacrifices on the battlefield, shed blood for our nation, have been injured uh, in, in, in war, uh, that have uh, have been uh, recognized with the Purple Heart. Uh, that, you know, we've had over two million uh, individuals recognized with the Purple Heart since 1932. Uh, that's when that Purple Heart uh, was reestablished. And so, uh, you know, just within this past year, since I've been here, uh, I had the privilege to see a Purple Heart presentation for a Chief Master Sergeant in our medical group uh, and, and know uh, that the, the toll that an individual takes uh, and, and the Purple Heart is just an acknowledgement uh, to their service and sacrifice, uh, but doesn't make up for what they give uh, their country. And so keep those folks who have uh, been recognized with the Purple Heart in mind. Uh, pause and think about them on Saturday, the 7th of August, uh, which is National Purple Heart Day. I just ask you uh, that you join me in that. Uh, and then the other thing, uh, just know that, that this is real. Uh, the 88th Air Base Wing uh, right now has a teammate uh, that has been hospitalized for COVID-19. And so we just want him and his family to know that we are thinking about him. Uh, he, he continues to fight the good fight each and every day. Uh, but when you look at the progression of things and think about uh, uh, the seriousness of this, uh, we have our, one of our own teammates that is hospitalized on a ventilator, uh, doing everything he can uh, to, to keep pressing forward. And we're here to support you and your family uh, as you're in this fight. And so know you're, you're in our thoughts and prayers. Team, I appreciate all that you're doing. I appreciate uh, you giving me the opportunity to serve you each and every day. I appreciate my teammates that spent some time with you today uh, to, to bring you up to speed on where we're at and better educate you on uh, what we're seeing and how we need to move forward. I definitely thank the public affairs team that continues to uh, put these things on and support us so that we can maintain transparency to get good comms and information out to you. And I appreciate our, our sign language team uh, who is always the hardest working team in the room uh, as we do one of these things. And so thank you very much uh, for all that you do for us. Until we chat again, uh, stay safe, keep looking out for each other, uh, and have a good one.